FBC kids. Go with Miss Patty. Woohoo! We, I'm telling you, we need to bottle that energy. How many people could use that kind of energy this morning? <laughs> I'm telling you. Awesome. Hey, so today we're in week three of our series, Guardrails, and, and I want to let you know that this week's subject is a touchy subject. Um, many people will get to the point of, oh, well, you know, as a church, you shouldn't talk about this, or, or some people will say the church talks about it too much, and, and the reality is that we're supposed to preach the whole word. So, so I'm not here to tickle ears. I'm here to preach the word. I preach the good stuff and the bad stuff. And, and if it's inside God's word, that's what we're called to preach. It's not just picking and choosing the good and the easy stuff. And with that being said, I do have a question for you this morning. What do you think of when you hear the word success? Now, see, many of us will think of different things. Some of us are going to think about um, big paychecks. We're going to think about nice houses or nice cars or, or whatever it may be, maybe having these large bank accounts, you know, because the world says he who dies with the most toys wins, right? Wow. So, so, so it, it's all about, hey, what is success? And, and in a world driven by success, it is all those other things. It's having that big bank account. It's having that big house. And, and it's funny, I remember a commercial from years ago when this guy was riding his lawnmower. And he said this, he said, we've arrived, we have a nice house in a desirable neighborhood, our kids go to a private school, and we have two new cars. We are the envy of all of our friends. How did we do it? We're in debt up to our eyeballs. <laughs> and as much as me, we, we may laugh about that, sadly, guess what, that's the reality for many people. That is the reality that they have so much credit card debt where they're living this life where everyone thinks everything is peachy, but yet they're paying a high interest credit card and, and, and that's where everything's going and that's the life that they're living. And, and, you know, we can all be consumed by this desire to keep up with others. You know, we want to keep up with what the neighbors or the Joneses are doing and, and thinking that, you know, we need to look successful. And then what we do is we make these unwise decisions. We, we make these unwise decisions with our finances, and, and we dig this hole that just gets deeper and deeper day by day, month by month, or year by year. And, and it seems like all of a sudden you're drowning. And what do you do? You make more unwise decisions. I do want to say from the beginning, there's nothing wrong with having money. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it, but we need to be careful and, and make sure that money doesn't have us, because that's a reality. Having money or money having you is two totally different things. And, and with that today, the kind of the big idea today is this. While it's a wonderful tool, money makes a terrible master. While it's a wonderful tool, money makes a terrible master. And I think knowing this, it's, a, it's an important to remember that this, guardrails are extremely important when dealing with money. It is easy to put our hope in our possessions, but they will never completely fulfill us. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dig in and see what God's Word says today. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. If you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry, there is one in the back of the pew, as always. It will be up here on the screen. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dig into this subject that a lot of people don't like to talk about. But here's the reality. There is over 2,300 verses in God's Word about money alone. But no one wants to talk about it because of the reality that the way we treat money or the way we treat others because of money, a lot of times is not and goes against what God's word calls us to do. Amen? So let's dig in. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. 
No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But he was dismayed by this command, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were astonished at his words. Again, Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astounded, saying to one another, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. Peter began to tell him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So as we open up, we see the very beginning of this. We see this wealthy man, and, and he comes to Jesus talking about how to, how to inherit the kingdom and basically leaves and turns his back on Jesus. Jesus gives him an opportunity and a chance for eternal life to basically be saved, and he basically tells him, hey, sell all that you possess and give everything away to the poor. And it's pretty easy, sounds easy to do, and ultimately the act of giving it away and giving to the poor would then give the man real treasure in heaven. But giving away everything, and by if he would have given away everything, I think it would have accomplished three things. I think first thing, he, he would have been getting rid of his, what was his real God or his master. He would have been getting rid of his possessions or his wealth. He would have been helping those around him who were in need. And thirdly, he would be storing up true wealth in heaven, where it's not going to be lost, it's not going to be stolen, it's not going to be ruined. Jesus told the man to, to then take up his cross and to follow him. It was a call for this young man to make that public commitment to Jesus. To, to make that public profession of faith, sell everything he had, and live his life for Jesus. But when the young man hears these words, he turns his back dismayed and walks away from Jesus. He chose his wealth over salvation. He chose his way over God's way. He chose eternal death over everlasting life. He chose the world over the kingdom of God. When it all came down to it, he chose hell over heaven by the choices that he made this day. Jesus in Matthew 6, 24 tells us this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. A few verses before this, in, in verse 19 through 21, he said this, Don't store for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, the reality is Jesus is revealing a heart issue. It's an issue that so many of us have with, with our heart and, and that so many of us fall prey to. We, we fall away from 
what it, we're called to do, and, and our hearts actually chase after things that are non-eternal. We, we chase after the things of this world, and, and, and we chase after these things that we think are going to satisfy us, and, and then we get them, and guess what? Then we're not satisfied, so then we go chasing something else, and we think, oh, well, this, maybe this will satisfy me, and we continue to chase all these different things and never get to satisfaction. Instead, we end up with a whole bunch of stuff that does us no good whatsoever here on earth because we can't take it with us and it's just going to rust or be stolen or end up going away. So, so we really need to focus. And, and I think as apart from the transforming power of Jesus, our hearts are typically selfish. We generally, our hearts are going to look out for me, myself, and I. And I think as we begin to look at these guardrails, which is what we're, this whole series is about, putting guardrails in place to keep us on track for what God wants us to do. I think as we put guardrails in place for handling our finances, it's in, extremely important to have a good biblical background or a good biblical knowledge on what finances and on the way we should handle our finances. First, I want to say that money is not moral or immoral. Money's neither good nor bad. Money is neutral. So let's get out that, that out there real quick. Money is neutral. Having it or not having it does not mean you're blessed or not blessed. Remember, in, in, in the time Jesus was telling this story, the Jews would have really like not understood it. Because in their mindset, they believed someone who was wealthy was blessed by God. And someone who was not wealthy was cursed by God. They didn't have because of some sin in their life. And unfortunately, many people today still think the same way. Oh, this person's rich because they're being blessed by God. No. They may be rich because they've made right financial decisions in their life. They didn't live off of a credit card. They didn't spend more than they brought in. But it has nothing, rich or poor, has nothing to do with being blessed or not blessed by God. Having it doesn't mean that God's hand is on you, and not having it doesn't mean that God's removed his hand from you. The only time that money actually becomes spiritual is how we handle it. When we handle the money, that's when it becomes spiritual. That's when it be, can be either good or bad because of what we do with it and the heart behind what we do with it. See, see, realize this, the world is full of rich people who are stingy. The world is also full of poor people who are generous. Now, there are rich people who are generous, and there's poor people who are stingy, but when you look most of the time, most, a lot of your rich people are stingy, and most of your poor people are generally more generous than others. They will give their shirt off their back before other people will. So it's something for us to look at. And, and I think when we really start looking at our finances, as we've talked about the last two weeks, as we build these guardrails in our lives, we got to look to Matthew 6, 33, which says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. So ultimately, as you start to look at this guardrail of your money, start looking at the guardrail of your finances, I think that when we understand Matthew 6, it helps us to better understand how to use that, what money we do have. It's going to give us a different idea. It's going to keep our focus differently if we're looking at seeking first his kingdom. Seeking first his righteousness. Doing what he calls us to do first. And, and I think the goal ultimately for each of us is to live generously, glorifying Jesus through everything we do. That's what we're called to do. I, I think a lot of times, you know, we, we sit there and we, we go through this. You know, if you've done any type of financial peace university or anything like that, it, it says to name your money. And I think as Christians, we're good at naming our money. Yeah, this is my tithe. This is my mortgage. This is my car payment. This for groceries. Or you even do the envelope system where you put the money in the envelope and you name it. I think naming money is a good thing, but it's not the ultimate thing to do. Because 
Even though you name it, you may know where it's going to, but does it always really go there? Exactly. No, it doesn't always go there. And, and of course, there's this big debate among the Christian community on whether tithing is a New Testament principle or if it's an Old Testament principle. Well, this sermon is not about tithing. Ultimately, I'm going to tell you, if you believe that tithing is part of the New Testament covenant, then that's perfectly fine. You should be given 10% of your income to a church or some type of religious organization. If you do not believe it's part of the New Testament, that's perfectly fine too. It's up to you. However, I think you should still be generous. You should still have a generous lifestyle. Because I don't think there's any way that you can read God's word and not get that we should be generous. Yeah. So, and, and unfortunately, there's many different scriptures we can pull up to pull any, wherever you believe about money, whatever you believe about the tithe, whatever you believe about giving, we can pull up scripture to probably support every single way you can come up with. The only mandate I see that makes any type of sense in the New Testament when it comes to the tithe or it comes to generosity is to be cheerful in doing it. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be cheerful givers. We're called to do what God calls us to do. We're called to be generous in everything that we do. So the reality is... We just need to be intentional in our generosity. Be intentional, um, and I think that's a very good guardrail to put into place of, I'm going to be intentional with my generosity. I'm going to be intentional with my giving. I'm going to be intentional with all that I have to do. And, and while we may not, we may not, truly know what we do. Hey, you know what? Maybe we give each month we give this amount, or maybe we do it off of a percentage, or, or maybe we do it bi-weekly, or whatever way your generosity, however God has placed it on you, just be obedient to what he called you to do. Be obedient to, to what he called you. Maybe you're getting a tax write-off. Maybe you're doing it anonymously. That's between you and God. It, it's got nothing else to do with it, and the goal here is not to give a viewpoint on tithing, on how to handle your money. I, I, what I think here is the goal is to get us to be intentional about our generosity. Be intentional about what you give the way God calls you to give it. You can write it down, you can budget it, but the whole thing is when you write it down, you budget it. If you do the envelope thing, don't only write it down, but actually do it. See, a lot of us have good intentions and we say, oh, we're, you know, we make out this budget and, and we're going to do this, this, and this, and then we like really don't do it, you know, because maybe something got in the way and we had to use some of this to do this and, and now all of a sudden our generosity isn't there because we can't afford to do it. When it comes to finances, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That should be that guardrail before we do anything else. And be intentional with what you do. I think what you'll find is that being gener generous actually strips away selfishness. When, when you're generous with what you have, when you're generous with others, it's very hard to be selfish when you're giving to somebody else. I'll tell you, ultimately, don't spend more than you make. I mean, it's pretty basic, but, but when your outflow is bigger than your inflow, you're going to get in a terrible financial situation. You're, you're going to end up where you don't need to be. And, and unfortunately, society is going to tempt you to buy stuff that you really can't afford. It's going to tempt you in every way. You, you think of all the advertisements on, on TV and, and on the radio and and. Pretty much any place you go, if you play a game on your phone, there's advertisements that come up, and you know it's the next biggest, best thing, and you can't do your life without it, and then you're sitting there thinking, oh, I need this, because this advertisement makes it look so good, and then you go and you buy it, 
And guess what? You're still not happy. You're still not satisfied. And, and now it's not the newest, biggest, greatest thing because now there's a new advertisement out there. And, and I think a lot of times we get caught up in this. And, you know, sometimes we, we oh, I've got to have this. And then we don't have enough discipline to say, hey, I can't afford it. You know what? I can save for it and it can wait. But unfortunately, the world in today say, oh, order it now from Amazon. You can have it this afternoon. Order it now. You can have it the next day. Order it now because your friends and your neighbors are going to love you that much more. And we get so caught up in, and stuck into this that we, oh, I've got to have this. And we overspend. We actually spend and we put more out than what we're actually taking in. And then them great credit cards with them high interest come out there. Oh, you qualify for this. You get, I get so much junk mail with things that I qualify for. Between my emails and the junk mail that comes to my house, if I actually filled out every one of them, I'd have like a stack of credit cards like this, which would be crazy. And imagine the interest I'm paying on all of them. Well, we all fall into this trap, and guess why we fall into it? Because we first don't seek his kingdom and his righteousness when it comes to our finances, when it comes to the decisions that we make. Is it going to glorify him, or is it going to glorify me? And a lot of times we get stuck with the glorifying me. And I think this guardrail, again, gets back to that condition of our heart. And you got to ask yourself, who is your master? Is it God or is it money? Ultimately, what do you seek first? Are you seeking your own happiness? Are you seeking to glorify yourself? Or are you seeking to glorify the kingdom? Where is your focus when it comes to your finances? You know, back in 2005, there was a movie that came out called Cinderella Man. And the Great Depression was in full swing during it. And this uh, guy, James Braddock, and his wife, they go to visit some of their friends. And as they go to their friends, he's still living in this high-dollar apartment, you know, up there. And they get there, and they walk inside, and all the furniture is gone. There's no furniture inside this apartment. They're, they literally... Everything is empty. They sold every one of their possessions. Everything they owned, they sold, but they continued to live in a high-dollar apartment. And they tried to live in it because they were trying to maintain an image of being wealthy. They were trying to keep this persona, and, and their friend's life was being controlled by an image that they couldn't even live with. And I think a lot of times in today's world, we try and do the same thing. We try and live with this image that, that we're better or we're got more or this or that. You know, like I said at the beginning, he who has the most toys win is not the case. But that's how we'll try and actually live our life like we have more toys, we're winning. Are you really winning? Not if you're running up credit card debt, you're not winning. Not if that money in your life has become your idol, your God, or your master. You are not winning. It's not working the way you have it. You know, to, today's scripture, we see that Jesus approached this man, and the man simply asked, how do I obtain eternal life? How, how do I get there? Jesus answers him with some things about, you know, keeping the commandments, and the, the guys real quick, oh, I've done that since my youth. I, I've kept all of the commandments. So Jesus took it a step farther. Jesus knew his wealth was a God or a master in his life, so Jesus told him, go and sell all of your possessions and give it to the poor. The man could not let go of it. The man walked away because he could not do what Jesus asked him to do. If he would have sold his possessions, he could have helped his neighbor. He could have helped so many other people. And I think it's important to understand Jesus isn't saying that it's sinful to be wealthy. Because it is not sinful to be wealthy. See, so many people try and 
try and take 1 Timothy 6.10 and they try and say, oh, well, money is the root of all evil. No. The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money will actually give you cravings and cause you to wander from your faith. It'll cause you to go where you don't want to go. It'll think that you are it, that it is your God, and you will follow that money wherever it takes you and end up where you don't want to be. Exactly what we saw with this young man today. He gave up eternity for possessions. He gave up eternity for a lifestyle. There are people in this world today who are giving up eternity because of their love for money. Money is the God or the master in their life. And as much as they may claim, I am a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, if you were a Christ follower, you would handle your money differently. You would look at the kingdom principles of money. Remember, the issue that the man spoke Spoke, uh, the issue with the man who spoke with Jesus was that he had not had that not that he had wealth, but that the wealth had him. And too many times we allow our position, our possessions, to have a hold on us instead of God or Jesus having that hold on us. What Jesus was asking this rich one, young ruler is what he's asking us: Are you willing to give up things? Give up the things in your life that you think make you matter. Think about that. Are you willing to give up the things in your life that you think make you matter? Because it's a reality. Are you willing to give up the things that make you feel important? See, when we set financial guardrails, we need to have a gospel-centered focus in our identity. Knowing that it's not about the money, it's about the kingdom. It's about doing what he calls us to do. When, when good question to ask would be this. When making purchases, be willing to ask yourself, why am I making this purchase? Why am I doing it? Am I doing it for my own personal satisfaction? Now, honestly, don't get me wrong. There, there are things that we do for our own personal satisfaction. I buy a lot of books. I read books. I try and read at least a book every two weeks. So I constantly buy books. But the books that I'm buying are also, most of the time, kingdom-focused. It's about something I'm doing, whether it's to for crisis intervention, for counseling, for just edification of myself, it, it's still, everything's still kingdom focused. But now there are times that what I buy or what I purchase may not be kingdom focused. Is it bad? No. But when that controls what I want to do, when that controls my life, when, when I've got to have it just because my neighbor got it, then that's when it becomes a problem. There's nothing wrong with having money, and I've said it from the beginning. Money is not the root of evil. The love of it is the root. And when you go out and you're doing something, honestly ask yourself, why am I making this purchase? Why am I doing this? Because a lot of times you may find out that you're doing it for the wrong reasons. So Understand, God ble God's blessings come in many ways. They come in many shapes, and they come in many forms. His blessings are to be used to reflect his goodness. They're to be used for his glory. They're to be used for the good of our neighbor, for us to show the love that Jesus showed for us. That's what we're called to do. <clears throat> so you think, what can I take away from this message? I think there's several things. First, are you truly saved? You might be saying, what, Pastor, are you truly saved? Yeah. What do you trust to take you to heaven? Do you think your works will get there, your possessions will get you there? Only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way there. No other way there. What's your attitude towards your money? Do you love it? 
You want to hang on to it? Are you just trying to use it to get more? None of it's going to get you to heaven. None of that's going to get you to heaven. <clears throat> Ultimately, money is for service of the Lord. What can we do to serve him? <clears throat> the Lord gives us what he does so that we may use it <clears throat> to advance the kingdom of God. That's what we're called to do, to be good stewards of what he provided. And, and I think if we look at that, forget about just the 10%. So many people get stuck on a tithe. So many people get stuck on the 10%. Instead of worrying about 10%, why don't you just take it this way and say, Lord, it's all yours. What do you want me to do with it? Totally different concept. See, because a lot of people have a problem with the tithe. A lot of people, oh, well, it's Old Testament. It was only to the priests. It was only to this. It was, it was of grain. And it was as, you know what? We can fight every single argument with Scripture. What counts is where it comes from here. And if it's all his, ask him what he wants you to do with it. Now, granted, there's certain things that he's going to tell you. Hey, pay your rent. Hey, pay your light bill. There are some things that he may tell you, uh, do you really need to be doing that? That's the ones you got to look at. The, the ones that are going outside needs, when it becomes those wants, them are the ones to start looking at. Where's your heart at in them? Is it for your own personal pleasure? And if it's for your own personal pleasure and you can afford it, that's great. If it's for your own personal pleasure and you're running up credit cards, you might want to rethink what you're doing. Because is it really honoring the kingdom? Are you really honoring his righteousness by what you're doing with it? See, I, I think God's plan for our wealth is twofold. I think first he tells us to divest. He tells us to let go of it. He tells us to let go and let God. Then he tells us to invest. He, in, he basically invites us so into the kingdom. And, and you can go back, look in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, or 2 Corinthians 9, 6. We're called to sow into the kingdom of God. So that's where our investment should be, is into the kingdom. Unfortunately, some people fixate so much on money. It, it's you think about it when you get up, you think about it when you go into bed, and you just fixate on it all day long. If that's true for you, then money is the master of your life. If you worry about it from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, that is the master of your life. That is the idol, that is the God in your life. If your attitude towards money needs work, come to Jesus and let him straighten it out. Dig into God's word. And do what he calls you to do. Last question. What can you get from this? What have you given up to follow Jesus? What have you honestly given up? Has following Jesus cost you anything? Now for some people you may say no. Oh it hasn't cost me anything. For some of us it's cost a lot. It's cost us family. It's cost us friends. It's cost us what we thought was loved ones. For some of us, it may have cost us a big home, a small home, a six-figure job. There's all different things that it may cost us. The difference is when, when you're sold out for Jesus, you will do some things that the world doesn't think make sense. I've said it before. I walked away from a six-figure job because another Christian on the job who said he was a Christian wouldn't own up to boost in the numbers so he could get his bonus. And I basically said, either we're going to fix it or I'm leaving. Needless to say, I signed my resignation that day and went home to my wife and said, uh, by the way, I just quit my job. being obedient to what he called me to do. It wasn't about the money. It was about the moral principle of let's do what God calls us to do. Seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Walked away, and guess what? He provided the whole time. 
He provided for everything I needed. I didn't get my wants, but he provided for all of my needs. <clears throat> As I said at the beginning, the whole big idea is, while it is a wonderful tool, money makes a terrible master. Money makes a terrible master in our life. And important, remember, guardrails are extremely important when dealing with money. It's easy to put our hope in our possessions, but they will never completely fulfill us. Money can buy a lot of things, but there's a lot of things money can't buy. Money can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you sleep. Money can buy you books, but they can't buy your brains. Money can buy you food, but it can't buy an appetite. Money can buy a house, but not a home. Money can buy medicine, but not health. Money can buy amusement, but not happiness. Money can buy fine things, but it can never buy beauty. Money can buy you a cross, it can buy you a crucifix, but money cannot buy you a savior. Money cannot buy your way to heaven. There's nothing that you can buy here on earth that will eternally put you in heaven. You can wear all the crosses, the crucifix, the shirts, all this, whatever you want to buy and wear to make people think you're a Christian from the outside. It will not buy you a Savior unless you give your heart to Jesus Christ. That is where it starts. That is the bottom line. This young man in this story today refused to give up his possessions, refused to give up the idols in his life because he thought they were more important here on earth than eternity. And there are people here today still making that same decision. Still making that same decision. To, oh, well, I need to go do this because it's going to make me happy. Meanwhile, you're putting yourself into debt. Meanwhile, you're going farther into debt, and then you're going to come back and woes me. Ain't no woes you when you did it to yourself. I don't know why God's not blessing me. If you're not doing what God called you to do, do you really think he's going to bless you? Do you really assume that you're going to get everything you want like he's a vending machine? That's not what it's about. The only way for eternal life is to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. The only way you can't buy it, you can't do enough good deeds to get there, is through that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's through taking that step and move forward and realize that, hey, you know what? I, I don't have it all together. My finances are wrong. My life is wrong. Everything about that I'm doing is wrong in my life. But it's okay. Because Jesus still loves you. He loves you everything you've ever done, no matter how much messed up your life is, no matter how jacked up your life is. Jesus still loves you. God loved you enough to send Jesus to die on a cross. If you think you can buy your way into heaven, you're sadly mistaken. <clears throat> God's word says we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. So every one of us in this room, everyone watching church online is a sinner. Every one of us. The person sitting next to you is a sinner. The person sitting next to you falls short of the glory of God. But yet God showed his love for us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Every sin you've ever committed in your life, he died for. Every sin you're still going to commit in your life, he died for. And God's word says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You notice it doesn't say if you write a big check to the church, you will be saved. If you write a big check and buy a lot of things, you will be saved. None of that. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I, I tell you that God's word says today is the day of salvation. There is no better time than the present to come forward and say, Pastor, I'm messed up. Pastor, my life is in shambles. Maybe it's even, Pastor, I'm in so much debt, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, we're all in debt to Jesus. We're in debt to him 
for the price that he paid for us on that cross. And because we're in debt for him, we should not be in debt in this world. Hey, guess what? It happens. I'm not telling you, that we, you know, you're never going to have debt. Some of us are good about it. We pay cash or we don't get it. If I can't pay cash for it, I'm not going to get it. I'll save up. I'll put money aside until I get it. I've been on both sides. I've even been down the middle. I got some cash. I got some debt. Changing the focus to focus on his kingdom and his righteousness will change the way you focus everything in your life. So during, after this final song, I'll be up here. Maureen will be up here. And if you need prayer, if you need to accept Jesus, I want to encourage you after this final song, make a move. Come up front and we'll talk about it. We'll pray with you and for you. And you can make the decision today to change where you're going to spend eternity. Don't be like this rich young ruler. He turned his back on heaven to spend eternity in hell. Hell is real. Heaven is real. Where do you want to spend the rest of your life? The choice is yours. It's a personal decision just like a personal relationship. It's not about a religion. It's not about a denomination. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. As I always say, first and foremost, I am a follower of Jesus before anything else. That's what we need to be known as. And maybe you're struggling with finances. Come up, let's pray about it. Pray about it and get your focus on his kingdom and his righteousness. And then ask him what your next steps are. And let him guide you into doing what he calls you to do with the finances that he gives you. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you do in our lives. We thank you how you provide for us. You provide for all of our needs, and Lord, you even provide for our wants. But Lord, I know there's people who struggle with finances. Lord, and this is a subject that so many people don't like to hear about in church. Well, Lord, I'm not talking about what someone should give. I'm not talking about what they should do. I'm talking about what you call us to do. Lord, that we will seek first your kingdom. That we will seek first your righteousness. And then let everything else be added to it. Lord, may you be the Lord, the master of our lives. And not our money, not our finances, not our things or stuff. But may our focus remain on you and who you are. And Lord, my prayer is that if there's anyone in this room that does not know you, that they will make that move today. That they will come forward and say, hey, you know what, Pastor, I am messed up. I am jacked up, but, but I know I'm loved. And Lord, I, I, Pastor, I need to make Jesus the Lord over my life. And Lord, if someone struggling with finances today, may, may they seek you. And, and may they seek you in their choices that they'll be making in the future. And Lord, I just ask that you continue to use us in a mighty way for your kingdom. And Lord, make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue Spirit worship. Hey, thanks again for joining us here today at FBC Lantana for Church Online. And, and, and if, if you enjoyed what you saw today, I'd just like to ask you to go ahead, go to our website and, and help support this ministry as we try and outreach and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And you can just go to our website, fbclantana.com slash give, um, and you can make an online donation right there. Again, I encourage you to get connected to a local church, and especially if during this message you felt compelled to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, 
definitely go tell somebody. Let someone know because that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And, and from there, get connected to a local church. Hey, we would love to provide you with some resources with that. You can go to our website, fbclantana.com. And on the very front page, you say, give my life to Jesus. Click on there, and at the bottom of there, there's some links and some good information for you. And just wanted to say, welcome to the family.